share with you a little bit that during the financial crisis, Professor McLeod was asked by numerous radio stations, television stations, and newspapers to share her expertise so that the public would learn more about the situation. And today we are honored to have her share that with us. Uh, Professor McLeod is a chartered financial analyst. She joined Ohio Wesleyan back in 1999, and before that, she was a asset liabilities management person in the banking industry. She has degrees and degrees and degrees. You can read all about her online. But without further ado, the first thing I would like to do is to present her with a formal, lovely picture of the poster that we use to advertise the event. So thank you. Thank you. And Professor McCall. Great. Well, I really appreciate being able to, to talk to you here today. And I'm going to learn more about how to use PowerPoint in this presentation, but you came to hear about the causes of the financial crisis in 2008. There are several factors that contributed to this crisis, but it is the interaction between those factors that is just as important in understanding the development of the crisis. A disclaimer, understand that when I use the word bank, I am referring to a generic financial institution and that could include commercial banks or investment banks, thrifts, and other types of brokers, lenders, or mortgage companies. Many people believe that the crisis arose because of deregulation. In fact, it was a failure of regulation. While it is true that the loosening of barriers between investment banking and commercial banking encouraged U.S. financial institutions to participate in activities that had long been forbidden them, it is important to remember that the investment banks actually got into trouble in their traditional realm of business, investment banking, not those allowed under deregulation. It is also true that the government's long-standing policy of promoting home ownership contributed to the housing bubble and the homeowner indebtedness. Mortgages, I hope most of you know, are loans for real estate could be houses, could be other commercial buildings. The borrower pledges the real estate as collateral against the loan, so that if regular payments are not made, the lender can take repossession of the real estate and sell it in order to repay the loan. Standard practice, called a conventional mortgage, asks for the borrower to put down 20% of the amount they're borrowing or the asset's value. So if you want to borrow 100,000 to buy a house, you need to put down 20,000, and then the bank will lend you the remaining 80,000. And so we talk about that as an 80-20 loan to value. The 20% down helps protect the lender from fluctuations in the asset value, and it gives an incentive to the borrower to maintain the property and continue timely, timely payments on the loan. So remember that 20% and stick that away. Today, I want to cover securitization and some unintended consequences. Talk about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which were important players and continue to be. Um, what I call playing limbo with uh, loan credit quality. I'm hoping that a lot of you have had to try to play limbo, you set up a bar, and you keep lowering the bar and seeing if you can still get under it. And it seems to me that that's often what we are doing with credit quality, continuing to lower and see how close we can come and still um, be playing the game. We want to talk about credit insurance and an entity called credit default swaps. So you'll understand more about that, which is a type of derivative uh, by the end of today. I want to talk about Sarbanes-Oxley and more unintended consequences, and we'll have a conclusion. So securitization, I want to start by looking at a brief look back to the 1980s, when most mortgage loans were made by thrift institutions, that is the local savings and loan. Financial institutions are intermediaries. They provide a depository for those people with extra money, and they loan to those people who need money. They make their profit on that spread. 
the difference between what they pay for the deposits and what they earn on loans. In general, people depositing money want access to their accounts with very little notice. So we call them demand deposits, right? You can walk down to the bank and demand your money. And those borrowing money prefer to have longer term loans. At least their time frame is longer than those who are depositing money. This creates a nice steady stream of spread for the financial institution until rates became volatile. In the early 1980s, the prime rate went over 20%, causing many institutions to go upside down. That is, they were paying more on deposits than they were earning on their loans. Over 700 thrifts failed, and we had a bailout then too, which cost taxpayers over 160 billion in direct costs and took over a decade to complete the cleanup. It's a little bit of the history. Innovations instituted after that bailout contributed seeds to our problem today. And that's a theme that I'm gonna come back to again and again. We need to explain or understand the concept of securitization. Very simplistically, banks acquire deposits, use the money to make loans, and they generally hold about four to eight percent of equity for every dollar that they loan. The amount that the bank can loan is therefore constrained by the amount of deposits and by the amount of equity that they have. In securitization, a bank will sell this bundle of loans to another entity like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, and with the money that they receive from the sale, will be able to make additional loans. So it's a way for the many more loans to be made throughout the economy. That helped to lower the rate on mortgage loans, and it spurred home ownership and economic growth. And those were two very good goals. The purchasing entity, for example, Fannie Mae, takes those mortgage loans from all over the country and multiple banks or mortgage originators that meet certain specification and they pool them into a special entity, a dedicated legal trust. From there, a security is created, which we call an MBS, a mortgage-backed security. The mortgages in the pool or in the trust then are the assets behind, excuse me, what is going to be paid to the investors. So that security is sold in small pieces to investors, frankly, all over the world, although mostly in the U.S. So rather than a bank investing in a whole loan, right, for an individual mortgage owner, Many investors own small pieces of many different loans. And that resulted in a lot of diversification of the risk and also lowered housing costs. That also was a seemingly good thing. The problem was that it worked too well. Too much money became available for loans, which resulted in increased housing prices and an overstocked inventory. With cheap loan rates, housing demand outstrips supply, even though the housing industry was rapidly constructing new houses. Also, securitization spread the risk so thinly that no one was watching to see and monitor the risk that was still there. The rule of risk is that you can transfer risk, okay, but you cannot eliminate it. It was still in the system. And now we are much more cognizant of the fact that any risk still does reflect that potentially bad things can happen. So securitization is one piece of the puzzle. It's not the whole culprit, but it is a factor to understand. We also need to understand some of the history of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. The Fannie Mae National, or the Federal National Mortgage Association, which is now known as Fannie Mae, was established in 1938 to buy, hold, and sell only FHA insured mortgages. And that was it. But since then, 
Their program is expanded to cover all types of mortgages, including, in 1984, secondary mortgages. And we had the Community Reinvestment Act, passed in 1977, that encouraged banks to make loans in the neighborhoods in which they collected deposits and resulted in some substandard loans. Each step in this process allowed for riskier and lower quality loans. That was not by chance. Franklin Raines, CEO of Fannie Mae, stated in a 1999 speech, quote, we have to push products and opportunities to people who have lesser credit quality. It was Mr. Raines who began in 2001 to buy loans with 0% down. Remember that conventional mortgage? 20% down, now they're accepting loans with 0% down. This was a deliberate strategy on the part of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, even though these were government-sponsored entities, which are officially known as GSE, government-sponsored entities. They effectively have a government insurance against bad decisions. There had been an oversight board created in 1982, but it was largely ineffective. Congress was actively supportive of this expansion strategy because it broadened the base of people who could buy a home. And the U.S. is very, very strong in increasing home ownership. And so all of this seemed, to, again, to be a very good policy. In 2005, however, Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan and U.S. Treasury Secretary John Snow recommended that the portfolios of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac be reduced. They felt there was too much risk accumulating and that Fannie and Freddie were dominating the housing finance industry. Some sources put the GSE proportion of housing finance as high as 75 to 80 percent of the market. Congress, including many leaders now promulgating reform, actively opposed putting any restraint on these entities. I find it very ironic that the very people who are now leading the reform effort were the same ones who encouraged actions that caused the need for reform in the first place. There are some other factors that exacerbated the situation at the time. The Federal Reserve, for other reasons, had lowered interest rates. That stimulated home buying by effectively lowering the price of purchasing a home. Other countries began to buy larger quantities of U.S. bonds, including those from Fannie and Freddie, because of the implicit guarantee that the U.S. would not allow those bonds to default. And the rating agencies failed in their oversight role, and I'll talk more about that in just a minute. Overall, Fannie and Freddie were in a very conflicted situation. They had to try to promote government policy um, for affordable housing, but at the same time, they were privately owned and needed to show profits for their shareholders. And then we also had Congress and taxpayers who were being impacted by the decisions and outcomes of these entities. But you can see that all of these different factors were really pushing the market to a larger and larger mortgage loan pipeline. So people were wanting more mortgages, on the end of consumers, and there was a lot of demand from investors for those loans. So everything was moving forward to promote a lot of loans coming through the system. And that led to the question of how are you going to get those loans? New types of loan companies entered the market, many of which were less regulated and in some cases unregulated. Since many lenders, whether banks or other loan companies, no longer retain the mortgages within the institution, remember the securitization, the loan originators no longer were compensated by their interest payments, so they began to be compensated by loan volume. They were more interested in the quantity than the quality of the loans. And that was a significant factor in the development of the crisis. From 1970 through the early 1990s, approximately 64%, it varied a little bit from year to year, but approximately 64% um, of households owned their home. And 
because of the large demand and low cost of owning a home, and starting in about the mid-1990s, we had that number going up, and it reached to approximately, can't tell you, it went up. Forgot the number. Uh, but it significantly increased due to the driving of all the factors um, that we have looked at. In addition, the lenders lowered loan standards. Documentation requirements for income and employment verification were frequently waived, leading to what are called low doc or no doc loans. And in many cases, you'll hear those referred to as wider loans. Uh, because since you didn't have to provide documentation, uh, many borrowers lied and committed fraud. Remember that lenders traditionally had that 20% down, which gave a margin of safety if the value deteriorated. There were certain sponsored programs that allowed first-time home buyers, for example, to pay down only 5% and borrow 95%. But under the relaxed regime in the years leading up to 2008, those loan-to-value national averages increased to near 90%. That's a very, very high rate when you think about all the, net, the loans across the country. In some cases, loans were made over the appraised value of the house based on the expectation that a rising market would create a cushion of value. Because prices started escalating so quickly, many people bought a second home for investment purposes rather than for living. These are speculative buyers. They do not reside in the house, but they hope to flip or sell the house very quickly and make a quick profit. Uh, this is actually a symptom of what we call the greater fool theory. Uh, that is the actual term. Uh, the greater fool theory says that an asset will always increase in value, and so you can count on a greater fool than you when you want to sell it. Many buyers in the rapidly ballooning housing market were speculative investors, expecting that the rising price would continue without end. Remember the lenders that I mentioned from the early 1980s who had gone upside down on mortgages or on loans in general? One of their solutions was what is called an arm mortgage, an adjustable rate mortgage. While traditional mortgages carry a fixed interest rate, the rate on arms changed as often as every year. Remember, risk is transferred, not eliminated. A variable rate mortgage transfers the risk of a changing interest rate environment from the lender to the borrower. Since the lending institutions were taking less risk, they could offer lower rates on the arms as opposed to fixed rate loans, which made arms more attractive to borrowers until rates increased and the borrowers could no longer afford the payments. Lenders also pushed programs to lend to lower quality borrowers, the so-called subprime market. Subprime refers to the fact that these borrowers were less than prime, right, or standard credit quality. These people did not qualify for a loan under traditional credit evaluations. But with the juxtaposition of cheap money, great demand from investors for mortgage securities, and political pressure through Congress to increase home ownership, new classes of loan products were designed to enable subprime borrowers to purchase homes. The new products featured attributes that deliberately started with low monthly payments but could increase rapidly. Some, definitely not all, but sub some prime, subprime lenders were predatory. They took advantage of borrowers who may be uneducated in the financial world. So we see that they made loans that borrowers could not be expected to repay under the terms of the loans. That is predatory lending. So some subprime lenders were predatory lenders. There were some very legitimate lenders to subprime that were not predatory, but we saw a great increase in predatory lending. 
original adjustable rate mortgages had a low cap both for the annual increase annual interest rate increase and for the total amount of allowable increase over the entire life of the loan. This was in the range of a 2% cap increase per year and 5 to 6% cap increase over the life. That's relatively reasonable. Okay? However, in the response to new market incentives, these manageable guidelines were significantly broached. New Century, for example, once a major subprime lender, offered an ARM loan that started at 8.64% for the first two years, and then every six months, the rate would be updated and had a lifetime cap of almost 16%. Under this arrangement, the monthly payment could rise to 32% just over, sorry, the payment would rise 32% just within two and a half years of the loan. Even a good quality credit would have a difficult time keeping up with that type of an increase. All of these types of loans were packaged into securities, with securitization, mortgage-backed securities, uh, were packaged into securities by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and other agencies and sold to investors, mostly in the US, but around the world. Rating agencies were paid to evaluate each security and monitor significant credit changes. Investors relied on the rating agencies to do so, but the rating agencies had a problem. Actually, they had a couple of problems, but the biggest one with the new arms programs were that they used historical data to forecast default rates, but they didn't have enough historical data on new, low-quality mortgages. So they just used the data from the standard-quality mortgages and forecast default rates based on that. And you don't have to study statistics to know that that's not going to be a very good solution. One of the other problems is that the rating agencies are paid by the issuing company as well. And so we have a conflict of interest. Other egregious practices were discounting the model forecast of possible negative outcomes and relying on assumptions that uh, riddled the models that limited analyst judgment. So in other types of programs, an analyst could step in and say, that doesn't look right to me, and adjust the rating, um, but not with these new arms um, products. In my opinion, they should have refused to write those securities when they didn't have accurate data. But that would have cut out any economic ability for them, right? So they wouldn't get paid. Now we need to talk about credit insurance. That's another piece of this puzzle. The other party to a loan transaction who is concerned about the borrower's ability to make timely payments is the investor who purchases the mortgage-backed security. Right. They are based, those securities are based on a pool of mortgage loans. For several years, the market had been, a market had been developing in managing credit risk. Various types of items are available, all of which function slightly differently. But the main idea is that they pay the investor when an entity defaults on a payment. The most widely used mechanism for this is called a CDS, a credit default swap. Credit default swaps serve as credit insurance for the big international firms. These companies actively manage their risk profile and they purchase credit default swaps to ensure cash flow and protect against loss from non-paying loans. So for example, here General Electric would pay AIG, AIG was a large, one of the largest, the largest uh, issuer of credit default swaps. GE pays AIG a certain proportion of what they want insured. Okay? It's like an insurance premium. If there's no default, AIG keeps the premium. End of story. When there is default, then AIG would pay GE 
for any money that GE had expected but did not receive. <laughs> now, there are a lot of really interesting side effects to this, but first I want you to think about this. We now have a situation where lenders are compensated by the volume of loans that they originate rather than the quality of those loans. We have investors who believe that they will be paid whether or not the borrower faithfully stays up with their payments. Where's the incentive to care about credit quality? It disappeared. The only entities who apparently should care about the credit risk are the ones guaranteeing the credit default swaps, and they didn't. One employee alleged that the people designing the computer models for the credit default swap, swap risk assessment discounted the possibility of a housing collapse to such an extent that they changed the model to explicitly exclude such a collapse. The CDS arena it is completely unregulated and so lacks transparency that no one even knew how large the market was. How many default swap, credit default swaps were there and how much money was at risk? All we still know is that the numbers were very large. In mid-2007, the International Swap and Derivatives Association estimated that the market was over 45 trillion. Insurance companies are required by law to maintain reserves for a portion of their estimated payouts. For the most part, issuers of credit default swaps had no reserves. They did not report the amount of their agreements. That was true internationally, not just in the US. That alone would have been enough to cause problems, but CDS underwriters, the issuers, were also highly levered and concentrated in a few large firms. Remember that commercial banks usually make about $10 in loans for every dollar of equity capital. Some investment banks were loaning $30 to $40 for every dollar of equity capital, and in most cases, they were not even counting those obligations that they incurred under their CDS obligations. In other words, they had no capital supporting the CDS agreements. Another aspect of the CDS market is that it allowed, allowed investors for the very first time to bet against the mortgage market. There were a few very smart people who took advantage of this and recognized that the housing market was in a bubble and that they could use the CDS market to actively anticipate a correction up to that point, the most that you could do if you felt that the market was um, headed down was to just not participate. You would not buy. Now, with the arrival of credit default swaps, you could take an active position anticipating a downward movement in that market. And so that exacerbated, again, what was happening. And when the market started to deteriorate, the big firms who had issued the CBS had no recourse. And any decline in the housing finance market was directly linked and so carried over to the CBS market, which is why the collapse of the U.S. housing market spilled over into an escalating international financial crisis and eventually was followed by an economic crisis. And then we have another piece of the puzzle. Sarbanes-Oxley. This act uh, was implemented in 2002, and part of Sarbanes-Oxley requires firms to record the current market value of their securities portfolio. We call this process marking to market. This rule change was in response to some of the shenanigans revealed in the scandals preceding 2002. So again, seemingly a good thing, uh, but following the law of unintended consequences, further created additional problems in the 2008 era. 
As the debt market became concerned about the housing market and recognized the inability of people to pay or fully pay their mortgage obligations, the associated mortgage-backed securities declined in value. Following the mark-to-market rule, firms had to immediately recognize that loss, which eroded equity. And the leverage played another uh, important role in this era. Leverage reminds me of that nursery rhyme. When she was good, she was very, very good. When she was bad, she was horrid. The effect of leverage made any downward spiral multiply. And so for every dollar that those companies had to write off in loss, it was 30 to $40 in loans that could not be made or had to be retracted. So hopefully you begin to understand why credit tightened. As firms continued to write down their investment portfolios to reflect the housing market woes, concerns arose that those firms would not have enough capital and would go under. That scenario would trigger additional payments under the CBS agreements, and that's when we realized that the counterparty firms, the ones insuring payments via the uh, CDS swap agreements, the AIGs of the world, did not have the cash to fulfill their obligations. And they could not raise the requisite amount. So for all intents and purposes, the insurance that everyone had been counting on evaporated. The prospect of bankruptcy became widespread. Each downfall had an interlacing network of repercussions. The result, no one knew who was at risk. No one knew who had made CDS commitments. Who was going to write down how much of their investment portfolio? How large was that CDS risk for any given firm? Think large stakes, multiple musical chairs. There weren't enough chairs and you don't know when the music will stop. If you're not watching, you will be out of the game with no warning. There was no second chance. The stakes were high. Companies were going bankrupt. They were being taken over. They were writing off their equity. Who can you trust? To protect themselves, large companies began hoarding cash so that a neighbor's downfall would not take them as well. And once the big banks would not lend even short term to each other, we had a liquidity crisis. As intermediaries in the economic system, banks provide an essential ingredient. Think of money like your blood. It has to keep flowing to be effective. You can have the correct volume, but if it all pulls in your legs, it's not effective. So we had cash, but it wasn't in the right places. We didn't know who had it or who could be counted on. The world financial system was going into cardiac arrest, and it needed a rescue fast. And that is when we had the bailout rescue plan. So I trust that you can see the myriad of factors that interacted to produce the financial crisis. New programs that required little to no down payment and little to no documentation, along with the securitization trend, meant that too many brokers had too much money to loan without the proper incentives to, carry about, to care about the risk being incurred. Investors relied on erroneous ratings and assumed that securitization would create enough diversification with the credit, defa credit default swaps available as a backstop that they were not fo properly focused on evaluating risk either. Most market participant groups, including the regulators, did not quickly identify the potential problems because of a silo mentality they expected that any problems would be restricted to the housing industry. But because of the interconnectedness of these problems and the economy and globalization and the diversification achieved through financial innovation, the fallout spilled over to almost every other sector in the economy. Many of the recovery problems initial, or programs initially instituted were aimed at liquidity life support. 
that is, get money flowing through the economy again to keep the patients alive. While it took time to be effective, one of the most important aspects was that investors and the financial markets began to believe that the crisis would be solved. And belief and expectation plays a large role in the financial markets. And while the immediate problems have been overcome, corrective measures continue to be pr proposed. Banks will have to hold additional capital. Rating agencies have to change their review process. Low documentation loans are receiving more scrutiny. But some problematic aspects remain. Mortgage loan payments are still high and often unaffordable, particularly when the borrower is unemployed. So we have a great deal of foreclosures. Phoenix area foreclosures in 2009, for example, were 343% higher than they had been two years ago in 2007. Many mortgage loans today are still higher than the value of the underlying asset. And the vast supply of houses for sale precludes the ability of home prices to return higher for some time. The U.S. Treasury is now a partial owner of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which are being encouraged to buy even greater amounts of mortgages. Longer term, we need to restructure the financial arena in such a way that ownership involves risk. If you own a risky asset, you should have to be at risk for some aspect of that. You have to be on the hook when bearing risk. We need some restructuring that allows greater transparency of the amount of risk in the system. That includes uh, appropriate levels of regulation and equivalent regulation for similar risk-taking behavior. If two different products have similar risk-taking or risky aspects, they should be treated similarly. We need a more flexible system that allows for faster response to new developments in the financial markets. We need to minimize the role and impact of politics and special interest agendas. And we need to carefully scrutinize before implementation to minimize unintended consequences. As a people, Americans, maybe it's just humans, are quick to overreact. We've had very volatile markets in the months following uh, the crisis. We tend to implement fixes for the last problem. Instead, we need to look ahead and conduct an appropriate framework for the future. I find it unsettling that many of the core issues in this crisis developed in response to overzealous application of previous reforms. But as my colleague Bob Gitter so often reminds us, people respond to incentives, and we need to develop and appreciate the incentives that we are building into any reform. Questions? more 
people, the more groups that are involved in developing a solution. Uh, some caveats to that, but for the most part, the more different groups that are involved in creating a solution, the more effective that solution will be if we are all trying to reach a solution and not just watch out for our own political agenda. How's that for a convoluted answer? We do know um, that people respond to incentives, and so anything that comes up needs to be evaluated from that perspective. The goal, for example, the new bank capital regulations are trying to assign more risk to uh, mortgage loans. That's, that's a, probably a good thing, but that's a response to the past. The financial markets are always creating new products. And so I guess what I mean by the regulation should be flexible, that, that we don't have to wait for a crisis to have an appropriate risk evaluation and, and banks holding capital against that. Um, although banks hold capital against their loans, other investors don't necessarily have to. So there's a little bit of inequity there. I think things are in balance. We need to have balance. Diversification seemed like a good thing. And in general, I would promote diversification. And I would encourage all of you to diversify to the extent possible in, in many different areas. But if you assume away everything, that is not going to work. In finance, we talk about the world of Medigliani and Miller, the M&Ms. And they live in a perfect world where there is no taxes, there's no transaction costs, and I imagine if they were still doing things, there would be no risk. Um, that's a, a, play, a theoretical place to start, but in the real world, there are risks. And the outlier risk is possible. It is possible. Alice. I think it's much more enforcing regulation. And I think it's also much more a lack of common sense at times. Um, it, and, and people choosing to respond economically, uh, the business model of Fannie and Freddie since they were private entities having to show continued increase in, in profits when we really didn't have that many loans, the economic incentives for the rating agencies to be paid by the issuers of the security, the economic incentive of the mortgage originators by volume, because they didn't have to be concerned about credit quality. People were responding naturally and I don't think that more regulation necessarily would have helped that. Um, we did have some regulation that was not enforced. There were other areas where there was not regulation and I don't think that regulation would have helped. But some common sense or a different economic model would have helped. The thrift crisis in the 80s took over a decade to solve all of the problems. Uh, and there's no reason to think that we're going to be better this time around. Um, but we are in a much better situation today than we were even last year. Okay. So 
even though everything is not fixed and we continue to find other repercussions, we are in a much better situation. Um, people like fast solutions, and unfortunately there were people, both um, borrowers who lied, and there were lenders who put people in situations that they never should have, have made. There are people who will lie in, in all cases. Um, most people, I don't believe, are in that situation. I think most people will be honest. Um, but whenever you create a large program, you have to balance the good that you're going to do for the most people versus the problem people. And sometimes we implement things very quickly without considering the consequences of the implications. And, and sometimes it's easier just to, to write them off. And uh, it's really egregious, the things that we're learning about loans that were made and then loans that were put into foreclosure.
it's important that we recognize implications beyond the immediate response and that we are able to, I guess, take a, a bigger overall perspective. And that's why I'm really excited to see all of you here today and that Ohio Wesleyan is a liberal artist that you can understand this from multiple perspectives and have a good view of how people can react in, in different things when we institute new regulation or a new product is created that we think about all of the affected groups and think beyond just tomorrow, but three or four years down the line, what effect will this decision have? And hopefully we'll also take action early. Some of the circumstances that you mentioned, um, people knew and could see problems, but we didn't take any action housing prices started to decline uh, before the crisis. Mortgage, certain people in the mortgage industry understood that there were a lot of problems and they were waiting for it to crash. There were a couple of people who identified and invested in CDS to understanding that it was going to correct. We could have taken action much earlier if we had understood, if we had put the pieces together, if we had had the collective gumption to make a change. But there were too many people that had, that were gonna benefit economically by keeping, keeping the current programs. Thank you.